There are a few Python concepts that I completely overlooked when I started out. They seemed advanced or unnecessary until one day I finally tried them and instantly saw how much cleaner or faster they made my code. In this video, I'll show you five of these concepts. They're easy to understand, but they can change the way you write Python. Let's get started. The first topic we're going to cover are generators. A generator is a special type of iterable in Python, which just means that it can loop over it kind of like a list. But unlike a list, it doesn't store everything in memory. Instead, it produces values one at a time only when you ask for them. This makes generators great for handling large amounts of data efficiently without slowing your program down or using too much memory. So that's the big idea behind generators, but how do you actually make one? Well, it turns out it's really simple. You just use the yield keyword. Yield works a lot like return, but instead of stopping the function completely, it pauses it. The next time you ask for a value, it picks up right where it left off. Let's make a simple example of a generator that counts up to a given number. To start, we first need to make a function. Here I'll call it count up to and give it an argument n. We'll then make a variable for the number we're currently at, which will start at 1. Then we make a while loop that runs so long as our num variable is less than or equal to the argument n. Inside of it, we first write yield num. I'll come back to this in a bit. And we'll then increment num by 1. And that's it for the generator. Let's also see how we can use it. We'll write a for loop and then call our generator with 5 as an argument, and inside of the loop we just print the number. What happens when we call the generator is that the function runs until it hits the yield keyword, at which point it will pause and return that number. In the for loop it'll then print out 1. When the code in the loop is done running, we'll then pick up where we left off inside of the function. Num is now incremented, the while loop starts over, and once more we pass the function and return num, which this time is 2. This continues until the while loop in our generator stops running, at which point the generator has ended, and subsequently the for loop. When we run this code, we indeed see that it prints out every number from 1 up to 5. The generator we just made is actually somewhat similar as to how the range function in Python works. There are also many other interesting features relating to generators and especially iterators, which I won't get too in depth about in this video. But if you're curious, there are many other great tutorials out there that cover this in greater depth. I've linked a good one by Cora Schaefer in the description. Decorators are one of Python's most powerful features for writing cleaner and more reusable code. They let you take a function and wrap it with extra behavior before or after it runs, without changing the original function itself. To apply a decorator, we simply write an at symbol, followed by the decorator's name right above the function. Now let's define my decorator. All it is is a function that takes another function as input, defines some wrapper function that runs some extra code around the given function, and then returns that wrapper. Let's make the decorator print out the name of the function we're using it on by printing out the name attribute of the given function. When we now run say hello, it now behaves like this. We've now added extra behavior around say hello without ever changing the code inside of it. So when is this useful? Well, let's say I want to easily measure how much time a function takes to run. Here I have a function that calculates the sum of all numbers up to 10 million, and I want to see how long this takes to run. We'll add a timer decorator that measures this for us. Inside the wrapper function, we'll start the start and end times, and between these, run the function. At the end, we'll calculate and print out how much time has passed by taking the difference between the start and the end times. When we run this code, we now see that it takes approximately 0.8 seconds to run. The great thing about this is that we can easily reuse this decorator on any function, making it very modular. And this idea isn't just some neat trick. Decorators are used all over Python, like in web development with a Flask or Fast API, in libraries like TensorFlow, and in tools like PyTest. So as you work on more advanced projects, decorators are something you'll see and use often. In Python, a very common pattern is to create new lists by iterating over some other values. For example, say we want to make a list of the first 10 square numbers. The typical way to do this would be to first create an empty list, and then write a for loop over range 1 to 11, and inside the loop append the square of each number to the list. This works perfectly fine, and it gives us the correct result. But there's actually a more efficient and much more compact way to do the exact same thing. We can write everything in one line using what's called a list comprehension. The idea is simple. We create a list, but inside of building it step by step, we write out the loop inside of the list itself. And right before the loop, we write the expression we want to compute. 
what happens is that Python will apply that expression to every value in the iterable and add each result to the list. It does the exact same thing as our for loop, but all in one line and often much more readable. But list comprehension also have another very useful feature. We can choose to exclude certain values using an if statement. For example, say we want to only calculate the even squares. Traditionally, we do this by adding an if check inside of the for loop and then only appending the square if the number is even. In a comprehension, it works the same way, we simply write the if condition after the loop. If the condition is true, the value gets added to the list. If it's false, it's skipped. And this isn't limited to lists. You can use the exact same idea with other built-in types, like dictionaries and sets. For example, if I want to map every number to its square, I can do so in dictionary comprehension, where the keys are the numbers and the values are the squares. And here's something cool. List comprehensions aren't just shorter, they're often faster too. Let's test this. I'm going to use the timer decorator we defined earlier to measure how long each version takes. The regular for loop versus the list comprehension when running 1 million takes. The regular for loop takes about 1.2 seconds, while the list comprehension takes about 0.9 seconds. This makes the list comprehension roughly 25% faster, and the output is exactly the same. Sometimes when making functions, you don't always know how many arguments are going to be passed. That's when you can use args. When you write args like this as an argument with an asterisk in front, we will automatically store any leftover arguments passed into the function inside of a tuple. You can use these arguments by just writing args, making sure not to include the asterisk. For example, I want to make a function that can sum together as many numbers as we want. To do this, we need at least two numbers to sum together, but after that, we choose how many we want. First, we take two required arguments. Let's just call this num1 and num2. And after that, we can use args. Inside the function, we start by adding the two required numbers. We then loop over all of the args and add every value to the total. And at the end, return the total. We can now try printing out the result of this function. And we see that the function works no matter how many arguments we pass, so long as we have at least two numbers. Keyword args, and that's how it's pronounced by the way, the KW stands for keyword, works very similarly to args, but it, as the name suggests, takes in a variable number of keyworded arguments, meaning arguments that are passed by name. Instead of being a tuple, these arguments are passed in dictionary. For example, if I pass in some named arguments into this function, like x, y, and z, and print them out, we see that we get those names as the key in the dictionary, together with their corresponding values. It's also possible to use both in one function, like so. The fifth and final concept for this video is going to be lambdas. Lambdas are a quick way to write small throwaway functions in Python. They're also called anonymous function because they don't need a name. The syntax looks like this, where we first write lambda, and then what arguments we want to take in, followed by a colon, and then everything that comes after this colon is what's returned by the lambda. We call it like we usually would a function. You'll often see lambdas used when you just need a simple function for a short time, like when sorting, filtering, or mapping over data. Here I have an example where I have a list of tuple pairs, and I want to sort that list based on the second value in each pair. To do that, I can call sorted and give it the pairs list, and set the key, meaning what it'll sort by, as a lambda that takes in each tuple, and then returns the second value in the tuple. At the end, we print out the sorted pairs. We see that when we run this code, it indeed sorts the list by the second value in each tuple. If you found this helpful, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. I've got plenty more Python tips and tricks coming your way. Also, let me know in the comments which concept surprised you the most, or if there's something else you want me to cover next. Thank you for watching, and happy coding! Snakes!